Um, attention on the front end is really that reconstruction project plan, which has to include a really good site evaluation. If, if your site has been farmed for 30 years, you've just acquired it, and now you're going to seed it down, what you have to do for seed bed prep is way different than if you've got a CRP field or an old field with 20 or 30 years of established vegetation with you know, a seed bank that won't quit and, and now you're going to try to, in usually a, well, let me say a two year time frame, convert that over to, um, to natives. Um, land use history is, is critical um, and then on that site you, you have to map it out. Where were your mesic areas? Where were your dry areas? And then try to get prairie seed that matches to the, to the different community types that would have been present before they were destroyed on that site. Um, seedbed preparation. Uh, I'll, is, is a piece of it. Seed harvest, I'm going to talk about what we do there. Post-seeding management was one of the questions and, and monitoring. So seedbed preparation, what does our standard sort of my go-to look like? Well, start with a prescribed burn. And what that does in that old field area is it eliminates the litter, but it also stimulates growth. So all of your weeds start to grow lush and green. So when you spray it with herbicide, you get the best effect of putting down that herbicide. And we use Roundup. And then, um, and then burn it again. Get that litter out of there. Let the sun get to the soil get new germination of weed seeds and, and such so that you're, you're working on cleaning it up again and then be ready to spray usually a second herbicide treatment if needed. Uh, seed harvest. We primarily harvest off of native remnants. In the Nature Conservancy we're lucky. We have a lot of really high quality prairie remnants and they're, they're very diverse and so we, in my uh, experience we have bought almost no seed from the market we collect it off our own sites we've done some hand collection but not very much of that either we just rely on what we can get through a combine harvest usually in late August through September and that's the species mix that, that we use in, in most cases and I know there's a lot of stuff missing from that So with seed harvest, we definitely try to match the harvest site with the reconstruction area. If it's dry prairie, you got to get to a dry prairie site. Harvest seed from the highest quality remnants that you have, the most diverse. Use local ecotype seed, again defined as within 30 miles, is what we have uh, tried to strive for. Harvest only from recent burn units. Um, I am a firm believer in that as it relates to the germination, germination and viability of the seed. It, one project in southeast North Dakota where I couldn't find any <coughs> recently burned prairie that was diverse enough to get as a seed harvest site, but there was a hay prairie that we could rent that had been hay the year before that looked great, had lots of flowering, lots of seed production, uh, was very diverse, and we spent a lot of money collecting that seed, and that seed turned out to be just terrible. Um, the viability of it was just really bad. And I've since, you know, burned once, just now have decided that if you don't burn it, you're not probably going to get the greatest seed. Now, sometimes you will, but it's, I think, just critical. And then, having said that, don't overburn or overharvest your remnants for seed production. So when we started a reconstruction plan, it, we weren't going to accelerate our burn program to get the seed that we needed to meet the goals of the reconstruction plan. We were going to take seed as we burn for other objectives and other reasons within our overall prescribed burn program. Seeding, I've had great success with uh, all of the methods that have been mentioned here today. I, I, don't, uh, I don't say that you gotta use a drill or you're not gonna be successful, or you gotta fall dormant seed or you're not gonna, you know, with a, with a broadcast or you're not gonna be successful. I've seen really great success using any of those tools. Um, and post seeding management, I think, is extremely important. Uh, clipping um, and mowing is sort of as needed, where needed, but I think it has to be done. When you plant a vegetable garden and you put the seeds out there that you want to produce, you don't just plant them and leave it alone 
And even though we're doing this at the hundreds and thousands of acres, I think the same thing applies. There's competition, even in a heavily farmed field that's been farmed for 50 years and you go in there, there's going to be a lot of annual weeds that are going to grow much faster, produce way more shade, typically, than what a lot of your natives will. And so sometimes it doesn't happen and you don't have to clip it or you don't have to clip parts of it. But I, I, I have not seen, and we clip almost all of our reconstructions, seen that that has hurt um, the diversity or the quality of our projects. And, and I'll clip it as many times in the first couple of years as necessary to keep that to, to keep that sunlight getting to those new plants that I want to establish. Um, and prescribed burning, really important. Um, we burn as much as we can in those early years. If there's fuel there, even if it's really patchy burned, you know, I'm an advocate of burning it. Um, and then where you need to, when you got really aggressive exotics, herbicide spot treatments um, are important. And one of the things in the project that I'll, I'll talk about, specifically our, our recipe and what we did, is we even went to a pretty drastic measure where we went and used a herbicide overspray. And so I guess a, a few things about this project. Um, it's on the Blue Stem Prairie. It's only about 45 miles uh, northwest of here. Um, we called it Project 4. It was a 115-acre site. In the late 70s and 80s, it was cropped. It was corn, you know, th those types of crops on it. We acquired that tract in the mid 80s I guess it was it was seeded to an alfalfa <laughs> grass mixture because it was highly erodible soil and it sat that way it was hayed and stuff until the pocket gophers got so bad we couldn't get anybody to hay it and so it was mostly a very low diversity non-native uh, site that had a farming history but then it went into an old field for well 10, 10 years or more it sat as an old field essentially so it was a you know those are tough sites generally um, what we did was we combined seed from the Blue Stem Prairie and a blazing, the site we call Blazing Star Prairie, real near there, and we combined, uh, it looks like about 60 some acres total, 70 acres total of seed to put into that 115 acre project area. And on this slide you'll see what's in red are the number of prescribed burns that occurred and hopefully even in the back you can see the dates. So you can see that on this slide shows three fires. And then as you move th through to present, there's another four fires that we put into that project area. So I show that just to stress the amount of fire that we did. In yellow, I highlighted the dates that we actually seeded it. A lot of people would be pretty nervous about it actually seeding with a true action drill in late June, well into mid-July on that. But that's what we did on that site. And because up to that point I'd been doing a lot of, a lot of broadcast seeding and I didn't, want, I didn't like the idea of drill rows, we actually Truex drilled this thing two directions to try to hide the drill rows and in some ways it probably reduced that inter-row competition, you know, weed invasion issue that we heard about just a little bit earlier. Um, but as you'll notice from the recipe there, we did not get two herbicide applications on that site and the first year after seeding it was real clear that we had a real problem yet with brome grass, quack grass, and some cool season weeds. And you could see there was good diversity coming through that project area, but the cool season component was just disgusting to me. And so we rolled the dice a little bit, and so we seeded in, 19, in June, July 1997, but then down on, in late October, October 22nd, 23rd, we went ahead back into that 115 acre project there and we sprayed the entire thing with two and a half quarts of Roundup per acre. And it was after some killing frosts and we had experimented a little bit with this in strips to see what it would do. And it was pretty impressive the result that, that was obtained through doing that. And I'm not sure with the small screen that, that um, you can see this, but these slides that I'm gonna go into were taken from that project area this just this past summer, uh, July 20th here, which are two, two different pictures from that project area. One is on a little bit drier portion where you can see lead plant and a couple different coneflower species and, and uh, purple clovers. And then if you move into the more mesic culver's root and uh, the meadow blazing star and more lead plant and, and uh, good diversity. But then about a, three weeks later, you know, when I was out taking those pictures, I could see rough blazing star everywhere, but not really in flower yet. And so I went back and took a few more pictures from that same project area. And you can see that, you know, just incredible diversity. 
that's in that project area. We didn't add any seed to this. Well, I take that back. We hand collected two species of stipa and we seeded in transects 100 yards between those transects because we didn't have that much seed. That was the only hand collected seed that we actually added. The rest just came from harvesting recently burned, very good quality, um, diverse prairies. So, um, so that, that was one of the you know, many projects that, where we tried some different things and, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to try things. I mean, you really have to let what's happening out there tell you what you need to do next and stay flexible is I think really, really important. But of the questions that were sent to us, one of them was about early establishment. Um, basically, what would you do the first year or two after seeding of the project area? And I think I pretty well talked about that, but I would typically mow at an eight to 10 inch height the first two years. I think a flail mower is great, but we use a lot of rotary mower stuff to do that. I think even a sickle bar is probably better. Um, and, and mow where, you know, as needed and, and where needed, I guess. You don't have to mow the entire site, just where it looks like there's going to be too much competition. Um, and I'm an absolute, you know, burn baby burn. If it's patchy, that's fine. If only 30 or 40 percent of it's going to burn, burn it. And that's what we have tried to do, and I think that it has resulted in some of these, you know, some of our projects being successes. Um, and I guess I already mentioned this, flexibility is key, you know, don't get stuck in a rut. You really need to look at the, you know, the site, and just because you have a written plan that said you were going to do this and this, if it's one of those years where, you know, things are really growing aggressively in terms of some of your annual weeds and you need to get a second or a third mowing in there that year, get it clipped. And, and don't wait too long. The, one of the you know, worst things you can do with really little seedlings is go out there at one point and you know, stuff is kind of getting this tall that you don't like and you see some good stuff coming and you think, oh, I'll give it another week or two. Well, anybody that's growing a garden, you know what happens in a week or two with stuff that's this tall. Suddenly it's this tall. And then when you clip it, you're laying so much biomass down on top of really small seedlings that you're not helping yourself at all when you do that. So you have to stay on top of it. Uh, the, one of the other questions is, will reconstructions last into perpetuity? Uh, and talk about the novel ecosystems concept. And I'd heard about that, but I'll admit I had to Google it and say, what, just to get a little bit more information about what that was. But, you know, my answer to this is I, I really think that they will. And, you know, the novel ecosystems concept is, is that due to changes by man with climate change and exotic species, that you're wasting your time to try to restore a remnant prairie because you, you, you can't do it, it's not going to last, and so just take what you have, think about what the, the, the ecosystem function is that's important in that ecosystem, and just be happy with what's there. And I just, I'm not going to buy that, that's a cop out to me. I mean, I think that if you have a really good um, diverse prairie, that's the best ecosystem to go into the future with, to provide pollinators what they need, to provide soil erosion, to, pre to prevent soil erosion, to water retention, all of these things. And they're going to change. They always have changed. I mean, the eggs 10,000 years ago was trees up here. So ecosystems are going to shift over time. But if you have a really diverse, well-established native system, I think it'll shift in the best ways possible. Don't just, you know, it, it seems like, you know, don't let the the weeds get the best of you and give up. That's kind of what that seems like to me. So that's how I would respond to that. What's the biggest reason diversity drops through time? Well, I haven't seen much of that. And that project I showed you is 20 years old. It looks better today than it did 10 years ago. It is an awesome project, and we have many of them like that. But I think, you know, I'll be blunt. If it, you know, you got to come up with one answer to the question. But so here I would say it's a lack of disturbance, and it's specifically fire. So if you're losing diversity in time, graze it, burn it, mow it, do something. I think it needs to be disturbed, and, but in a good, smart way. Oh, I couldn't stop it, just one reason. No. You know, exotic species control, I mean, if, if you've got some pretty, like that site where we oversprayed with Roundup, I think we will, we, I could see tremendous diversity coming we didn't leave anything unsprayed, but I'm convinced if we would have left that cool season problem that was still in that project go, it would look like it does today. So by getting that overspray in there and killing that stuff, it resulted in a, in a much better project. 
Brush management is the biggest thing we're dealing with now. We've had 30 years of wet times up here, and we have just a tremendous problem, and we're trying some new things now on Blue Stem Prairie to deal with the brush. We are, we've got willow and things growing. I mean, the transition zone is moving into the Dakotas when are with the rainfalls that we are having, and, and we are really fighting brush right now. And if we don't get to what would be considered more normal climatic conditions, we're gonna have to rethink what we're doing with brush. <clears throat> And, you know, why does it drop through that time? I think low diversity seeding mixes to begin with, with maybe some of the real easy to establish forbs in there that tend to drop out as you get grass competition and too heavy on grass species is certainly another reason that, that I believe is there. Number one reason plantings fail. I, I really think that in a lot of cases it's poor, a poor reconstruction plan. You don't know the site well enough. You don't know the history of the site well enough. The weed problems and bad project management. And I don't want to point a finger at, at an individual, but some of the reasons have been mentioned. You have a you have a grant, and you've got two years to get it done, and you can't get enough uh, treatment into the the seabed prep to get it cleaned up, and so you you rush it because you got to get the money spent within two years and you result in a bad project. You hire a contractor who took on way more work than they could do, and right when you should have got that annual weed, that first year clipped, it didn't get done until a month later, and, and a lot of damage was already done. And so I, I don't blame the drill. <laughs> I don't blame the time of year on a lot of failures. It, it's just because I've seen success through all of these different techniques, I really think that it's about the, the, um, the ability to sort of execute your plan and, and have a really good plan to begin with. And certainly weather's a wild card in there. So key steps to long-term success. I think that was the last question here. Um, the, sort of four, four things, you need a good reconstruction plan, but I just think that the three real critical components are seabed preparation. And, and that varies, it's what are you starting with? If you just bought a farm and you got half native prairie here and the other half has been farmed for 30 years and you know it's clean, seabed prep, you've won that one, I think. There, that's not gonna be the reason for failure of that project if it fails. But if you don't get really good local ecotype seed in my opinion, that's my number two. If you don't have that good seed, that may be the reason that that project fails. Even though you had the best seedbed prep you ever could have hoped for, if you don't get good seed, you got a problem in my opinion. And then I think it's too easy to get complacent once it's seeded and you go out there that first year and stuff's coming and you think it's pretty good. If you don't keep on the fall, keep diligent for five to 10 years on follow-up management, burn it as much as you can, clip weeds when you need to, I think you can lose diversity and lose what might have been considered a success if you would have just been more diligent with your follow-up management. And I know we all have full plates on our jobs and it's hard to do all that, but. I, you know, yeah, I was asked to give my opinion, <laughs> so, so that's what you got. And so I think that was the last slide that I, that I had there. So, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right, if we can get all of our panel members, and uh, Scott included. Do you want to back? Or you